So that good morning. Welcome to, I guess, the last day. Who's hanging around over the weekend? Are you all happy to fly back home? Probably flying back home. Cool. Yeah, I'm a local in meantime, so um, I'm uh, originally from Belgium, lived there for uh, 46 years, and recently, only three months ago, moved to, to Redmond, so I'm like, what, 10 minutes away from here, um, which I think is a, is a, a benefit. It's, it's close to the Microsoft campus, so yes, Microsoft is uh, my employer, pretty, pretty easy. You probably figured that out already by checking my email address, uh, which is one of the important pieces, I would say, to keep in mind. Um, if you have any questions, I would say obviously ask them during the session, but if you want to stay in touch later on, feel free to do that as well. What we're going to talk about, controlling your pipelines, and I need to be honest, mainly Azure pipelines using Azure DevOps, using Azure technology. So mainly merging Azure cloud features, allowing you to integrate governance into your pipelines, making them smarter and helping you as an admin to not trust yourself because we all know that you cannot trust yourself, right? So we're gonna rely on technology, and hopefully that's gonna work out a little bit better. So in short, I don't have that many slides. Um, that's my, my personal tag. I hate slides, although I'm, I'm doing a lot of training every single week, um, but I'm trying to avoid slides. Now, for some reason, they wanted me to produce some slides, but I think I got like 18 of them, where nine of them are my demo placeholders. And then a title slide, an introduction slide, a thank you slide all the way at the end, so I got like maybe four technical slides. So nothing too bad. What are we gonna talk about? First of all, why and what about controlling your pipelines? What's the mechanism? What's the benefit? Why should we do it, right? Next to that, once you know why we're gonna do it, I'm gonna talk to you about how you're gonna make that possible using some Azure features and integrating with Azure DevOps. And from there, it's demos and more demos. Q&A all the way at the end, but if you got a question, concern, just raise your hand. Uh, you don't have to wait all the way to the end of the session. And I can hang around for a little bit longer if you don't want to ask your question in front of the audience because everything's getting recorded, which means I need to pay attention to what I'm talking about. Um, but feel free to wait all the way to the end as well. It's up to you. So you already know I'm Peter, originally from Belgium, but living in Bellevue for now. And my day-to-day -day job is a Microsoft technical trainer. It's probably one of the easiest job roles within Microsoft. It means I'm providing Microsoft technical training every single week. My prime topics are Azure architecting and DevOps. So anyone into Azure exams, probably, hopefully I would say. AZ400, that's the DevOps track. AZ305, that's the updated um, architecting track. And a little bit of free time that I have, it's still going back to Azure, where uh, before the pandemic, I was traveling like 98% of my time across the globe. And it's pretty hard to take a hobby with you, like gaming on a Surface laptop isn't always that easy. Um, watching Netflix is okay, but I get pretty bored of just watching Netflix. So I find out that um, I could actually produce content besides just talking about it, I could also put something on paper. And that's where I published eight technical books on Azure in the last eight years. So, and if you send me an email, I might be able to give you one for free. There we go. So why and what of pipelines? Why do we need control? First of all, because DevOps is complex. It all comes down to making buddies. Developers need to be friends with ops teams. But that's the easy part, right? No, it's not. It's the hard part. Because nobody likes to become friends with an awkward team. You're the ops team. You're the developer team. And you don't really like each other. Because there's always friction. But apart from the dev and ops team, you also got the project managers. Anybody liking project managers? Mm, not really, because they're the ones who are like pushing deadlines. They're the ones who complain. They're the ones who maybe call you two o'clock in the morning when your server is down, right? So that's another friction that we have. But apart from the, 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 the silos, you got a DevOps team and they're managing DevOps, like really touching Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions or any other DevOps tool if you want, where the Azure team they're managing Azure. They're not always touching Azure DevOps, but they're managing Azure. It's your cloud center of excellence, right? They got all the permissions to manage the Azure environment, but it means that there's not always that integration. And then the developers are producing software. They're creating artifacts. They want to get them published, and that's another friction. And all of those are, again, bumping against the whole concept of DevOps. 
where everything should be like this nice oiled well running machine, and it's not always working. And then back to my title slide, you cannot trust yourself. Like, oh, I'm going to walk over to my developer team because I need some permissions, or I want to find out up front like what kind of packages they're using. And next to that, I'm a nice guy, I'm socializing, and I'm going to walk over to my Azure team asking some permissions, or maybe it's not at all working like that. And that's why we need that control. And then eventually, that's where the, the, I would say the ultimate goal of DevOps comes in, is what happens during an outage? What if we could use Azure governance, Azure control mechanisms to or block my deployments because it's going to fail anyway, or maybe using it in the other way where we're going to rely on our pipelines integrating Azure intelligence to actually run a deployment whenever something goes wrong. Sounds good? Make sense? So that's the theory, I would say. Now we know like this is why we're going to integrate it, how to make that possible. Pretty easy, two main topics. Azure governance. Who's already using Azure? Like really managing it, touching it, controlling it? Not that many, okay. I mean, it's all technology, I know, it's been around for 12 years. About time that we bring up something new, right? <laughs> Could be a good one. So what is Azure governance for the ones who don't know? Um, Azure governance, it's a strategy, I would say, using Azure features. And again, if you're totally new to Azure, you might go like, well, maybe I don't really know what you're talking about. If so, let me know, raise your hand, ask a question. More than happy to throw in a couple of other demos. First of all, Azure Active Directory. The ones who are not using Azure, are you using AWS? Yeah. So why AWS and not Azure? You work for Amazon? Well, totally cool. Nothing wrong with that. I work for Microsoft, and I mean, we can still be friends. Yeah, we're going to have a coffee after the session. Why not? It's not even important, right? DevOps is not about tool. It's about culture. And we're nicely working on that culture. So why not? Azure AD is your starting point. It's authentication. How do you call it in AWS? Identity management something something? See, that's how you build up culture. They build a cloud, we already have a cloud. We got the identity tool, the one and only one you need to remember. And they're just leveraging on that. <laughs> Way cool. So Azure AD, right? Next to that, Azure RBAC. It's what you guys call IAM, Identity and Access Management. We call it RBAC in half of our documentation, but in the Azure portal, we also call it IAM. So that's where you're going to define, I got my user object, my admin, or I got my Azure DevOps, or my GitHub Actions, or my third-party pipeline scenario, and I'm going to provide it limited permissions, like the least amount of privileges, to run that pipeline. Nothing more, nothing less. That's the idea. And then last, Azure Policies is where you're going to integrate governance in anything that can or cannot run on the platform. If you're like a US-based organization, maybe because of compliance or anything else, you don't want your admins to spin up resources outside of US Azure regions. That's what policies are doing. Or you want to make sure that although you're a full-blown Azure virtual machine admin, that you're not going to deploy the biggest beast of a server we have with multi amounts of terabytes and deploying a virtual machine that's like three, four, six, twelve thousand a month. That's what Azure Policies is doing. It's not Azure DevOps yet. It's just on the Azure side. I promised you demos, so it's about time to do a demo, and I'll show you the integration. So you go into your Azure DevOps, and the first thing you need to build out is like establishing that integration. You what? Well, the original first step, I would say, is authenticating. Obviously, you need enough permissions in Azure DevOps to do your magic. That's, I guess, pretty obvious. Now, pipelines are never running in user mode. I'm logged on as Peter to my Azure DevOps environment. When I'm going to deploy Azure resources, it's not really running in the Peter admin mode. It's running in a service principle mode. We're going to create a, some sort of service account in our Azure identity, and we're going to define permissions. So let's do that. So we go into our project, that's like the umbrella where we're going to build our pipelines, and creating a new service principle. Hey, look, we can integrate with AWS as well. Not surprising. I obviously already knew that, because it's the first one on the list. 
So we want to integrate with Azure Resource Manager, and we're going to do next, but I don't really know what the service principle is about. But over here, it's offering me automatic, and on top of that, it's oh, yeah, recommended. So anything that's recommended, that's what we go for, right? And let's do next. It's going to pull up some of my subscriptions. There we go. Let's do the Peter one. Because I'm the manager in my Azure subscription, I can do whatever I want over there. I'm going to give it a name, the PHS Summit. Connection should be good enough. Saving it. I'm going to save you a little bit of time because I already prepped all this. What happens here is that it's going to create a service principle over here. Providing, by design, contributor permissions. What is contributor? Sounds pretty elevated, right? Within Azure, you got a whole bunch of role-based access permissions. The highest one is owner. That means you own the subscription. You can manage security as well, defining who can touch my subscription. Contributor is somewhere in between. It's going to give you all permissions to do everything in Azure besides playing with RBAC. But what we can do right now out of an Azure DevOps pipeline, or later on if you want to do the same in GitHub Actions, but I don't have a demo on that, but the concept is the same because it's all service principle based, it means that I can deploy whatever I want. I got full permissions to go into my Azure environment and deploy everything. Nothing's blocking me. Where maybe, and that's obviously the reason why we're talking about it, maybe you have a pipeline, just one example, where the only thing the pipeline is doing is publishing containers. The permission you need out of Azure RBAC to publish containers is ACR push. It allows you to copy your um, Docker artifact, your container, into Azure Container Registry. Or if you want to communicate with AWS, they have AWS Container Registry. Same concept if you're using the public Docker Hub, still be the same concept. But you don't need full-blown contributor permissions to just publish that container. And that's the beauty about RBAC. So we started with Azure ED service principle, your identity object, although it's called uh, PE tender with the name of your Azure DevOps project, by design using that automatic configuration, it's giving you all permissions. So don't do that. If you don't need those permissions because your pipeline is just running, deploying a virtual machine, maybe connecting with uh, storage, that's another example you see here, don't give it contributor permissions. So the next question is obviously like, why is Microsoft doing it? Why are we recommending it, right? I have no idea. I didn't build the software. Um, I have no idea why it's do going in that way. But that's just a phenomenon out of um, the automatic behavior. The other way around is obviously using a manual configuration. But that's where it's going to ask you some details. Also not really admin friendly. I did another session and the recording my, <clears throat> sorry for that. Um, I did another session yesterday about securing Azure DevOps and not just Azure DevOps, talked a little bit about GitHub Actions as well, where I explained what's wrong when using service principles. So I'm not gonna repeat it because it's another session. Um, I'm publishing the slides and the recording probably later today somewhere because it's not in the conference um, backend system yet but we're working on that. So if you want to find out more about service principles and why and how to configure them, you're going to find that in that other session. All good, any questions? Cool. So governance done. Azure policies, I'll show you later on in another demo, like what's the outcome. The, the, the policy itself, again, allows you to block about anything you want to block. Defining these are the, the 5, 7, 15, 200, whatever number of virtual machine sizes. And if you want to deploy it through any motion, Azure DevOps, GitHub Actions, Terraform templates, um, manual clicking around in the portal, why not? It's going to block you because of those policies. If you try to deploy a VM that you're not allowed to deploy, policies are going to block you. And anything else. We're now we're going to move a little bit into Azure DevOps specific features. First of all, approvals for repos. What is approvals? It's what we call peer programming. You have a bunch of developers, they're going to build software, and you're going to trust each other to validate each other's work. And then maybe before publishing it, like moving it into your source control, or after it's stored in your source control, you want to make sure that somebody's watching over. 
controlling like the syntax of the code, controlling what kind of uh, packages you're using, if they're like up to date, whatnot, or maybe integrating security code scanning. That was also part of my session yesterday. Integrating security features into your pipelines. During the development phase, during the run phase, testing phase, unit testing, all those things, and even running it during the deployment itself. Where next we have DevOps release gates, or quality gates is like what the industry calls it, but the terminology within Azure DevOps is release gates. And then last, the DevOps environments. I'll talk about it and mainly showing you how it works. So approvals in a couple of different ways. First of all, branch policies. Who has no idea what a branch is in DevOps terms? A little bit, cool. So a branch is when you start developing on your local machine, you're gonna build version 0.0 of your software or the piece of software, right? Whatever you're developing. In a broader team, you're gonna publish it to what we call the main branch. It used to be the master branch, but we don't like masters anymore, so it's the main branch. Now, if you have a, a larger team, the risk is that everybody's gonna override that main branch. So what you can do with the branch policy is creating a Peter branch or uh, a specific feature branch, like I got an example that I used yesterday, that's called the, the PowerShell Summit branch. I know that anything in there is starting from the main branch or maybe a copy from somebody else's branch, and I'm gonna build up on that. When I'm gonna check in my branch, like my work is done for today or I'm in my sprint and I need to publish something to keep my PMs happy or the Scrum Master happy, um, I'm gonna publish it. And that's where the approval comes in. Somebody's gonna validate what you've been working on and maybe approving it. Hopefully approving it, right? Because that's in the end what we're, what we're trying to do with DevOps. And then automating that process. Next to that, we can also integrate it in the pipelines itself. Because what we do with branching is just publishing code. It's not really doing anything yet. Where next we're gonna create pipelines to compile, validating little piece of software that we built, is it actually running? Is it doing something, right? And integrating security scanning and anything else that I talked about yesterday already. Well now we could also integrate approvals into the pipelines. When are we gonna kick off a pipeline to compile it, creating an artifact, creating a Docker container? We wanna make sure that that process is never running until somebody's approving it. Well, now you could have somebody approving, or multiple ones, um, approving the source code, and then maybe two different individuals validating the pipeline run. And then eventually when you wanna publish something into your Canary deployments or production environments or uh, blue-green deployments, probably somebody heard about it, um, or just moving it to dev and test staging production, you can integrate um, approvals before the pipeline kicks off. Somebody's like, okay, cool. We're gonna allow uh, Peter to run the pipeline. When it's been published, like a web app is running on Azure, a database is deployed on Azure, before we're gonna expose it to our users, we want somebody else to approve it again. To just do that little quick validation, like is it actually working? Where interesting enough, a successful published pipeline doesn't always guarantee that the website is running, right? And that's what you can validate here. So how does it work? If you're using Azure repos, that's where you're gonna find all your source code and that's where you're gonna find your branches. I only got one in this example and I'm gonna save a little bit of time but you probably get the idea. So you can dive into branch policies and defining a lot of different settings. The ones I talked about here is approvals. So by design it's disabled so you need to enable it and you're gonna define um, the, the reviewers. Like if it's not getting reviewed, it means that the code from my branch will never get merged into the, the uh, main branch. Another one, but that's a little bit on, I would say the project management side, you can force an integration with work items. Keep that in mind for later on, I got a demo on that. A work item is like your to-do list. These are all the tasks that my whole DevOps team is working on and I wanna validate it. You cannot publish anything out of your branch source code environment if it's not linked to a work item. So that could be another step in the approval. And then you can bypass where you go like, well, I can be my own approver, but you need additional permissions to actually do that, where technically you're probably not really doing that, where maybe in case of like, a, I don't know, an emergency could be okay. We're now from here, we're gonna move to pipelines because that's in the end what DevOps is about.
And just grabbing one example. So I got my artifact. That's the outcome of running my compile uh, pipeline. And from there, I'm going to move it into production straight away. Not the best example. You should never push something really straight to production, but just simplifying the scenario a little bit. So what we can do here, <coughs> allergies are kicking in. What we can do here is integrating pre and post approvals. Oh. So whenever you see that little, I don't know, human being icon, it means you can define approvals. So I can go in and before I'm going to run or, or allowing the platform to kick off this pipeline, we're going to enable pre-deployment approvals. Well, now you can integrate with anyone. You can define approvers. Technically, that goes back to my first topic, Azure Active Directory based. Why? Because if you deploy your Azure DevOps environment by design because it's an Azure service, it's going to rely on Azure Active Directory. Even if you have external users, let's say I'm going to invite Peter at Outlook.com, I can rely on Azure ED, B2B, that's like two organizations using Azure Active Directory, exchanging users, or B2C, that's inviting an Outlook account, a Hotmail account, a Gmail account, a Twitter account, LinkedIn account, I think. So you're going to invite them in Azure ED, and from there they become part of your organization, although they're external users, and it means that you can search for those users in here as well. And then on top of that, defining RBAC for those external users and giving them Azure DevOps permissions. And that's how the cycle is, is again coming back. So from here, you can define approvers. You can define like a timeout, typically not really 30 days, but just a couple of minutes, right? Because DevOps is all about producing, running pipelines, producing software, running applications as fast and as many times as possible. And defining some other minor important settings, I would say, where over here could be important. The user requesting the release should not approve it because that's bypassing the whole benefit of having approvers, right? But every now and then it could actually be useful. And typically I would say two words, um, like a dev and test environment, it could actually be okay to allow yourself to approve it or maybe skipping approvals. On top of that, but I'm not really going to show you, um, the approval itself is getting initiated by email. So you don't have to wait in front of the Azure DevOps console the whole day before something kicks in. Just a second. Let's relocate to Seattle. The environment is cool. It's all green and everything. But if you're allergic to forests, it's not always working out that great. But we're still here, so nothing to worry about. Good. So that's the, um, the approval part. <coughs> Let me know if you've got any questions or want to see anything else. Otherwise, we're going to move on to Azure DevOps-specific release gates, where, again, other DevOps tools are typically calling it quality gates. What you're going to do is validating, confirming, maybe instating the quality of your pipelines. You're not changing the pipeline itself, so that's a nice thing if you go like, oh, this is very cool, but we didn't really use it today. How much do we need to change? Nothing. You already have your pipeline. You're just going to integrate two other clicks, and that's mainly it. So what is release gates? It's allowing you to interact with a couple of features, and I'll show you some of them, to, for example, validate work items, which means if you think back about one of the reasons why we should have control, it's because developers have a deadline. We call it a sprint, we call it iterations, and they need to fix bugs. Besides producing software, I think that's like the second important um, task for a developer, making sure that whatever you produced three weeks ago, with maybe a bunch of um, bugs or issues with, that you're going to fix that in by the next sprint. So what you can do with release gates is validating like, well, this pipeline is not going to run because you got many open items. And you can obviously define how many of them, like what's the severity and stuff like that. Or you can integrate with Azure policies. If you got Azure policies like blocking virtual machines where your Azure DevOps team doesn't really know about those policies because they're just downloading an ARM sample from the Microsoft Docs, or they are using Terraform or anything else, allowing you to integrate infrastructure as code, they don't always know about those policies. So you just go like, oh, my big beast of a SQL database server needs this specific Azure Virtual Machine. Not knowing that your CFO is not willing to pay for it. Obviously, the outcome is that you're going to build your pipeline, you're going to integrate your Terraform, ARM template, BICEP, whatever language you're using, and the pipeline is going to fail. 
because it's not getting that HTTP 200 from the Azure platform. And nobody likes seeing failing pipelines. Everything needs to be green, right? That's like my job is done. It's successful. I've done it, right? So that's where the integration comes in. Interacting with Azure Monitor. It's the baseline of your um, service level. You're going to publish something in Azure, and you want to make sure that it's running healthy. But what if it's not running healthy? What if my, um, I don't know, my server environment or my app services environment or my functions, anything you want to use in Azure, is suffering? Yes, we do have cloud availability. We have cloud scalability, but somebody still needs to manage it, right? Why not allowing the platform to validate? If there's an alert coming from Azure Monitor, and more specifically, Azure Alerts within Azure Monitor, it's going to block you from deploying it. Like an easy example, Azure West US is down. Right at the moment when you're running your pipeline. Guess what? The outcome again, failed pipeline run. Because the target environment is not available. So there's not even a point in running the pipeline because you already know up front that it's going to fail anyway. And that's what your integration here is going to do. And if you don't know that much about Azure Monitor, or you go like, well, too bad, Peter, we're not using Azure Monitor because we got Splunk or we got another third-party monitoring tool, that's where I would say a little bit more industry open REST API calls are coming in. You can just fire a REST API call to any HTTP um, target. And based on the feedback, like 200, cool, everything's great, everything's up and running, you don't need to run yet. Or if I'm getting like an HTTP 400 or anything within the 400 range, means like mm, it's not running <coughs> anymore. That's where we're not running the pipeline. Anyone into site reliability engineering, SRE, or trying to move into that domain? That's actually pretty cool because what it's doing there is actually flipping your mind. Where now you can reuse the same thing. Like if there's something going wrong in Azure because it's called uh, planned maintenance that we know in the next coming days that that Azure service will not be available because yes, Microsoft is telling you upfront, like we have maintenance on virtual machines, storage and, and some other components. You can actually run the same pipeline, but pushing it into a different region. And obviously again, automating the whole process. Where now your quality gate is watching over like, oh, everything's still running in West US, I don't need to do anything. But once I know that in two days from now, it's not going to run anymore in West US, I'm just going to redirect it to a different region. So that's reusing, and I'm not going to say misusing because it's actually quite powerful, but reusing the same concept, the same pipelines, just setting a couple of parameters, and slightly moving into that SRE mindset as well. Or then the other one, going back to my session yesterday, DevSecOps, integrating third-party security features like source code scanning, where one example here out of the screenshot in my environment is Sonar Cloud. One of the so many, if I remember correct, I think we had 94 different Azure DevOps security um, extensions that you can just download from the marketplace, allowing you to integrate security in your environment. Well, now you can reuse Sonar Cloud and probably any of the other ones based on what Sonar Cloud tells me, like is your source code secure enough or not to allow you to deploy the pipeline or blocking it from deploying. Like, you need to go back to the source code, fixing it, updating, NuGet packages, no Java, whatever language you're using. I'm going to run through that Sonar Cloud motion again out of a build pipeline. And only when it tells me that Sonar Cloud or any other tool is like, okay, all green, up to date packages and everything else, no security issues, we're going to allow you to run it in staging, production, or any other name of your environment. Good enough, you want to see it in action, most probably. Good. I'm going to try and close some browser windows here. So we did that. We did branching. Well, okay, cool. Yeah, why not? So I go into the same pipeline as before, my web app publishing to central US, where I had my approvals. We're now for the next one, we're going to integrate gates. There's a side version within Mike software over here, it still has build gates. I've only seen the screenshot, so I'm not really sure if it's actually a real version or just a, some Photoshop, but it was actually pretty fun. Important is that the validation is happening at least every five minutes. 
If you want to make it faster, you cannot do that. I think five minutes is okay. How can you bypass it? You're just going to create two different stages. Or you're going to create five stages and letting them check every five minutes, which still means that every minute something is going to get validated. If you want to make it a little bit longer hours, but not really seeing any real business case there. So from here, you're just going to add, and this list is expandable. So again, Sonar Cloud, one of the so many security features, I installed the Sonar Cloud engine extension into my environment, and without doing anything, it just shows up. So if you're using, I don't know, SNCC or um, Aqua for container scanning, it might show up as well. No, I don't know any of those 94, and which of them are showing up in this list. But worst case, again, if they're not even providing that integration, most probably it's going to allow you to run an REST API call. Or Azure Functions. Anyone using Azure Functions already for the ones who are using Azure? Yep, mainly PowerShell based probably. It's a PowerShell conference, so I need to mention the word PowerShell at least twice in my session. So Azure Functions over here allow you to integrate all your intelligence out of PowerShell. If you have your scripts today that are validating your runtime environment, just move them into an Azure function and keep them running from here. That's the idea. I'll start with work items, validating what our developers are working on, and it's asking me for um, a query. So I got this over here. Work items within Azure DevOps is called boards, and within the boards, you're going to create a work item. It's a pretty easy task to do. You can automate it. Um, if you integrate again with GitHub, you got GitHub issues. That allows you to be read out using REST APIs, and it means we can do the exact same demo. If it stops loading. There we go. So I got a pretty long list, not really extensive, and I'm just going to search for anything. Where it's not about building up the queries, I already have one. Should be in this list, I guess. Or let's create a new one. And it allows you to filter on basically anything. If you're a little bit into like Excel or um, enjoying VLOOKUPs or anything like that, um, it's, it's just selecting your work item fields and, and defining like this is the information I'm looking for. So I created a query where the resolution is a little bit against me. Let's see if we can do that again. PDT open issues, that's everything I still need to work on. And it means that I'm not performing as I should be. Although I only got like four items, but this could be 50, could be 500, um, could be different um, work item types, different severities, you could log bugs or any other issues or just open to do tasks. So you start from boards, create work items, creating a query, and from there, we go back into Oh, it was over here. Into our query, finding all the PDT ones, and we're going to define settings. Zero means you cannot have any open item. Even if there's one open item, we're going to block you from running the pipeline. If you got, like in my case, I got five of them. If I'm like, okay, cool, I'm going to deploy four of, or allow four of them to be open, then the mechanism is still going to work. Another example is, back to my, I'm going to show you the full work. Just going to closing to not slow it down too much. Back to gates, where we had query on work items, where now we can do another integration. For example, Azure Monitor. What happened to my Azure portal? So within Azure Monitor, you can define Azure Monitor alerts, and you are in control of the severity of those alerts. So I got one example based on Application Insights. It's our Azure Monitor component, allowing you to integrate uh, detailed views on your application state. And this is what ops teams and developers actually uh, like a lot, because it's going to show you real details 
real detailed views. Come on. It still doesn't really trust the, the video connection, apparently. So you define Azure App Insights. You go into alerts. If it's not an application, but you want to find out about networking or virtual machines or app services function, anything, it's all based on the same. You just go in top on the portal. You search for alerts, and it's going to allow you to centralize them. So the outcome is technically the same thing. So within you define alerts, looks like everything's good, as it should be. And you're going to define your own alert rules. Like if something goes wrong, like a, there's a, a failure in my environment, meaning it's not running anymore. HTTP 400, you connect to the URL, and it's not providing you the web app. Um, where well you're going to define the severity. Could be informational, could be a warning, could be like, ooh, something's wrong. Like a severity one, like it's blown up, right? So you're in control to define what kind of alert you want to read out. To just give you an idea about what we can log, it's pretty extensive. I think in total you can combine like 3,000 different ones. Based on those, you start with the alerts, and yes, you can use a PowerShell script to create those, to copy and paste them from other subscriptions, whatnot. You're going to rely on that monitor integration. Oh, good guess, I was right. We're now going to add our monitor. It's connecting to, no, I don't want to, why? Fat fingers, that's my excuse. Pipelines, releases. Monitor, we'll get there. Oh, pretty good on time, awesome. Azure monitor alerts, defining again evaluations where five minutes is the least one, repeating it every 15 minutes would be a typical one, and that's it. That's the only thing you need to do. What it's gonna do here is, again, before the pipeline kicks off, because it's a, it's a, a precondition, it's gonna check like, hey, Azure, for this specific target, in this resource group, this web app, for example, or any other resource, do you have any alerts? If so, can or can I not run this deployment? And you can already figure out just by doing this part of the demo again, that now you can also enforce multiple ones. Hey, Peter, what's the status of your work items? And on top of that, what's the status of the alerts? And based on those two conditions, we're going to block you or allowing you to run that deployment. The outcome is what I can show you as well. I'm not going to kick it off live because you already know that. It's at least taking five minutes before it's producing output. So I ran this a little bit of time back. And the outcome looks a little bit like this. So it's going to run your, your pipeline. And at some point, 2.35, awful timing to build demos, but it actually worked out pretty well because my machine is still in European time zone. <laughs> it's going to validate. What it's going to do here is running an Azure query. It's not about the query, obviously, but it's just firing off a REST API call, management.azure.com, connecting to my subscription and everything else. And it's going to check for the response from the API. And next to that, it's going to check if there's any severity um, level four. If so, I'm going to block the deployment. If this would be AWS, I promise you, if I knew that there was an AWS guy in my session, I would obviously extend my demos for AWS. Can you give me a free subscription for like a year? And then I can, can test some, some cool demos out. Where it's going to run the same validation every five minutes. Five minutes after mm, alerts, we're not going to allow you. Five minutes later, we're going to block you. And eventually, I cleaned all my alerts. Azure is back healthy, for example, or I fixed my own issues, why not? And it's going to successfully run the pipeline. You can do the same validation all the way at the end. So the concept pre and post is technically the same thing. Four monitor REST APIs, policies. And then after doing this in almost each and every week of my Azure 400 trainings, it's like, well, Peter, this was pretty good. We'll learn something. But the only thing you show me is Azure DevOps Classic. Clicking around in the portal, using the nice GUI. So mm, we lost 45 minutes. Who says yes? 
Did you lose 45 minutes? I hope not. Okay, cool. Right, the first answer is, oh yeah, totally right. It's Azure DevOps Classic, but I think that's still the beauty of Azure DevOps because it allows you to get used to DevOps in, in a slightly easier way. But that's not correct for this audience because you're all PowerShell experts, which by the way, I'm not, which means that you like coding, right? So what about YAML? Well, the first response is, well, maybe nobody's already using YAML, right? But that's not really correct. Or other feedback. If you want to use YAML, like um, pipelines as code, don't use Azure DevOps. Not correct. Azure DevOps supports for the full 100% YAML-based pipelines. And that's what I'm going to show you. Everything I talked about, release gates or quality gates, can be used in YAML. You don't need to go to the <laughs> classic first, copy-pasting everything. You just start from scratch with YAML. The only little catch is you don't have any options to define release gates out of YAML because it doesn't recognize that concept. What you need to do is using Azure DevOps environments. Where next to that, you need to update your YAML pipelines and adding one little line of code called environments colon release or whatever name you give to your environment. That's it. And I'm going to show you. That's going to be my last demo. So I go into my pipelines. I'll show you the environment. I created a new environment called release, or whatever name you want to give it. Before I called it prod, I called it staging, canary, uh, blue-green, whatever name you want to give it. And over here, it's a little bit hidden, I would say. We just call it approvals and checks. When I go like, okay, cool, they got approvals. Awesome. But that's like what I talked about like 35 minutes ago. It's not even about release gates. You go like, too bad, we don't have release gates. Well, now if you just click through, Anything that I showed you in the classic interface is coming back here, and actually even more. So now we got more features around quality gates in YAML than what we have in classic. The only one that's not showing up here is integration with Azure policy. Sonar Cloud is also not showing up here because it's just a different piece of the interface. But it's again going back to running a function, running REST APIs, and then we're back at the beginning. And then the only thing you need to do, so if you want to go with um, querying Azure Monitor, it's going to show you about the same as what I showed you already. Fat fingers. Two more minutes. Release. Checks. Let's see if this works better. There we go. The target resource group, if you don't want to check your full subscription. Defining what you want to filter on, the exact same severity as before, every minute, every hour. Same thing as what I showed you in the classic interface. And then the only thing you need to add into your YAML syntax is that environment colon name of your environment. That's it. It's going to run your pipeline, easy pipeline in YAML or super complex multi-stage pipeline. Whenever it's going to start up that little stage or the big stage, it's going to validate the, the approvals, the checks, and everything I talked about. In YAML, no differences. If you want to do this with GitHub Actions, approvals are baked in. So in the meantime, you can do um, approvals in GitHub. Um, they're not using environments, but they are working on release quality gates in a slightly the same concept. No idea what they're going to call it, but it is coming. So with that, I'm two minutes over time. My apologies. One last important, well, two important slides. I'm not going to tell you what we covered. I mean, you all paid attention. Thanks for being here. So you know what we talked about. What's most important is this one over here. <sighs> Hate videos. Um, feel free to reach out, stay in touch. On Twitter, LinkedIn, it's all PDTIT. On Facebook as well, but I'm not that active on Facebook anymore. Uh, shoot me an email. Last one, if you want to go through the exact same demo scenario, I have it completely written out in a blog post. 
aka.ms slash ADO Azure DevOps gates hyphen how to. The explanation is only detailing on Azure policies, but once you can that, get that one up and running, everything else is going to be super easy. And you still got the recording to check back on all the settings. Thank you for being here. Enjoy the rest of the conference and stay healthy and safe.